Survey shows American people today better housed than any people in history. When I first read that on the release, I thought to myself, they call that news? Everyone knows that, even using the word in the broadest sense. We are housed in more comfortable homes and apartments. We buy in more efficient stores and shopping centers. We work in healthier offices and factories. We know all this. But how many people know how this amazing progress came about? Where does the money come from? Because of the millions, I mean billions of dollars, it takes for this tremendous building program. In fact, it's impossible for the human mind to grasp the total amount of money that has been required to build the America we know today. Where then does all this money come from? Now we're getting to the point that is news, the point this survey makes. And to me, it's a fascinating story one on which I have had reason to do some interesting research. It really started when the first settlers came to this country on their road to better living. Those sturdy forebears of ours were willing to endure the hardships of the early American wilderness for the sake of personal freedom. And one of the greatest rewards of that freedom was the opportunity to build their own homes and become owners of property, modest though it might be. In the next hundred years, settlements grew and flourished, and the folks who worked hard and were thrifty could build better homes and better farms. The settlements became towns and cities. Trade and commerce started. Artisans and merchants expanded their shops and stores. The spirit of the free world had taken root in North America, and the winning of American independence charted its future course. By the late 18th and early 19th century, average citizens, as here in Williamsburg, were beginning to have savings in excess of their immediate needs. This started them looking for the way to provide long-range protection for their dependents. To satisfy this need, life insurance companies were organized, and people began taking out policies. The funds accumulated from the premium payments were invested by these companies from the very first in such safe securities as mortgage loans on real estate. And mortgage loans have become a traditional form of investment for these institutions. At about the same time, savings banks were granted charters by the states, and the savings of individuals were not only safeguarded, but channeled into further community enterprises. The rest of the century witnessed unprecedented growth and expansion as American frontiers swept westward toward the Pacific. New towns and cities sprang up in the wake of transcontinental railroads, and across the land new industries were born. Much of the expansion during this century was provided for by private capital, and many large individual fortunes and industrial empires were thus founded. But as time went on, and the country kept on growing, individual fortunes were no longer adequate to finance the continued expansion. During these years, however, the insurance payments and savings accounts of millions of small savers piled up enormously. These funds of all these small savers are put to work for the American economy. Good for the small savers and good for the economy. The trustees of life insurance companies, savings banks, savings and loan associations, commercial banks and pension funds must invest with a minimum of risk. Outstanding among such investments are mortgages, interest-bearing loans on homes, and other buildings. In 1934, the government cooperated with private business in creating FHA. FHA was born in the Depression. When nothing much was economically sound, here was a sound idea. Faced with a national need for more homes and a more consistent supply of mortgage money to build them, FHA came to the rescue by insuring long-term, low-monthly payment mortgage loans. 
home ownership was made possible for additional millions of families and stimulated a tremendous volume of construction. Now, most of the great saving and lending institutions were in the older parts of the country. Thus, insurance premiums and savings deposits tended to concentrate in the East. These institutions began to make mortgage loans in the areas from which the premiums came. As this practice grew, a new profession came into being. The profession of mortgage banking. You see how it grew naturally in response to the needs of the country. The mortgage banker is a specialist who obtains loans, large and small, for people in his own area from any number of local and national institutions. In doing this, he brings funds for construction into his hometown which would not be available locally. And after the mortgage is executed, he handles all the details for both the investor and borrower until the loan is paid off. It's quite obvious that these specialists, the mortgage bankers, play a leading part in the country's progress on the road to better living for us all. But what are mortgage bankers like? Well, about like any other hard-working businessman. Suppose we visit one, James Chandler. Let's follow this caller, Mr. Leonard Mercer of the Pasco Products Corporation, who was referred to Jim Chandler by a mortgage banker in the area of Pasco's home office. Mr. Mercer? Yes. I'm Mr. Chandler's secretary. Won't you please? Well, thank you. This is quite an attractive office you have here. Thank you. Mr. Chandler's waiting for you. Come in, Mr. Mercer. Is this your first visit here? Yes, it is. We hope it won't be your last. Well, that may depend on you, Mr. Chandler. We're decentralizing our operations. We're going to build a new plant uh, somewhere in this part of the country, and we're looking for a site. Your city is one of several under consideration, but before we decide, there are a number of problems to be resolved. Would you be interested in exploring these with us? We certainly are interested. This would be a fine thing for the city. There are several properties here I think you'll find very suitable. Here's one. Over here is another, but there's one. Just so happens there's a shopping center going up right near that spot. That would be convenient for your people. Yes, it would. The railroads already assured us that the spur track can easily be extended to this area. And that's the kind of information we need. Suppose I take you to see George Christie, the industrial secretary of the Chamber of Commerce. He has all these facts at his fingertips, locations, freight rates, electric power, and so on. Well, that would be fine. When can you arrange it? Whenever you say, and the sooner the better. Have you been in touch with the city council? Uh, not yet. That's another thing we'd like to be sure of, a cooperative local government. You'll have no worry here. George Christie, please. After we've talked with the chamber, I'll take you to see the city manager and the commissioner of public works. Hello, George. Jim Chandler. Oh, I'm fine, thank you. Say, George, I have a gentleman I'd like to bring over to talk about locating a factory here. I thought you would. Eleven? Fine, we'll be there. You don't waste much time. Well... <laughs> but that's what we heard about you. Now, if our plans work out, I understand you're in a position to arrange the construction financing as well as the permanent mortgage loan. Yes, we have good connections with our local banks for construction money. And when the building is completed, we can place a permanent mortgage with one of our institutional investors. Good. Now, there's one other aspect of this move that's important to us. It's housing. You see, we'll be bringing in a number of our people, and we have to have some assurance that homes will be available for them. Uh, how is the local housing situation? Well, frankly, it's a little tight at the moment. Mm, that's disappointing. Oh, well, not necessarily. Let that be our problem. <laughs> well, we can start over there now, if you want to. Right. If you're coming in here, Mr. Mercer, and your people need housing, it's up to us to see that you get it, and we'll get it for you. Uh, Mr. Chandler. Yes, Henry. On Frank Houston's home mortgage, we've arranged to defer his payment this month. He's out of the hospital now. He'll be back on the job soon. Glad you took care of him. He's a good man. Has a good record with us. Yes, sir. Mr. Chandler. Uh, is that your usual practice? Oh, yes, when there's a good reason. The lending institutions allow us reasonable discretion in cases of emergency. I'll see him tomorrow. Yes, sir. They recognize their responsibility to the borrowers in many ways. Let's go. 
As the two men walk along the street, they come to some current construction being financed by Chandler and Company. A little farther along, they pass several substantial older buildings put up more than a quarter of a century ago when Jim's father, James H. Chandler Sr., was head of the firm. Chandler and Mercer pick up George Christie at the Chamber of Commerce and move on to the city manager's office. All agree that the city council will have to authorize the water company to extend the necessary mains. The city manager assures them this can be done, as well as anything else that will help the move. The meeting ends on a high note of enthusiasm. Jim Chandler is pleased, but he knows full well all the work that still will have to be done behind the scenes if this project is really to get off the ground. The next day finds him calling on Phil Regan, a local builder with a good reputation. Jim wants Regan to build a number of new houses on the old Whipple property. All right, I'll try to have it for you by Thursday. Okay. Phil, this is the kind of home we're looking for. It's the best group of homes in that price class we've had yet. They'll go well on that Whipple track. But Jim, I've got about all the work I can handle right now. I'd like to do it for you, Jim, but I just can't see my way clear. This isn't for Jim Chandler or Phil Regan. This is for the city. A brand new industry, new employment, new business all along the line. Phil, no matter what other inducements we offer them, we can't bring them in here if we can't house them. Doggone it, Jim Chandler. You're a hard man to turn down. Well, it's the penalty of your business. What do you mean? You know a home builder builds more than homes. He builds communities, cities, lives. I ought to know better than to let you in here. <laughs> Every time I do, it's the same thing. Look, if I can arrange for the additional line of credit... I'll get it for you. Well, <laughs> what are we waiting for? <laughs> Let's draw our plans on these two models, send them in. Now, I still like this one over here. Let's send all three. All right, tell me what we'll do. Now we are beginning to see something of what a mortgage banker really does. The full and active life he leads, much of it behind the scenes, for the betterment of the community. Of course, things like this are not accomplished overnight. While he is waiting for word on the Pasco factory, the next few weeks, Jim is busy on a wide variety of business projects for people big and little. Here is the Simmons loan commitment for your signature. Oh, yes. Well, this means a pretty little ranch house for those kids out on Clover Road. I'm glad. They're such a nice young couple. As nice as they come. Twenty years ago, one of the first mortgages I made was for Jake Simmons, young Bill's dad. Bill was just a little tyke then. I remember I just bought a new car and I let Bill sit in my lap as we steered it around the block. He's never forgotten it. I see you haven't either. <laughs> What is this civic committee you asked me to remind you about? Oh, yes. The city manager asked some of us to serve on a community redevelopment committee. Write him a note and tell him I'll serve. Mm, yes, sir. And then you'd better line up my appointments for my trip east next week. I'll want the complete file on the Sibley housing track, the cooperative apartment, the Dewey warehouse, and uh, the new medical center, of mm. course. Will you want the Pasco material? No, I guess not. We haven't heard from them. That isn't like Mercer. We sent them everything they needed weeks ago, but... Uh... Oh, excuse me. Chandler speaking. Oh, oh, put him on. <laughs> Woman's intuition. Long distance, Mr. Mercer calling. Yes, sir. How are you? I haven't called before, Jim, because I didn't have anything definite. Now I have. You've got a deal. The board has approved locating the plant in your town. We're ready to go as soon as you can set up the financing. You'll get the letter tomorrow. You have all the figures you need, don't you? Oh, yes. It'll take a few days to work them into presentation form. Fact is, I'm going east next week. I'll submit it then. You bet. I'll be in touch with you, Leonard. Oh, same to you. Bye. Okay, I'll take that Pasco material. Yes, sir. So Jim Chandler heads east with several loans to discuss with a number of lending institutions with whom he constantly transacts business. One of them is a life insurance company, where he is welcomed by Ed Stevens, vice president in charge of mortgage loans. It's nice to be back here again. <laughs> well, what have we brought us this time, Jim? 
We know you've always got something interesting whenever you come to see us. Well, I've got several things here, Ed. One of them, a new plant loan I believe you like. Oh, get a couple of our industrial loan men in here. Send in Wilson and Turbo, please. The specialists come in and for the next several hours study the facts, figures, and exhibits Jim has presented. They ask him direct, penetrating questions, to which he gives his answers in the same direct, informed manner. Well, Jim, I think that does it. You've certainly brought us something concrete to take to our loan committee. Thanks a lot, gentlemen. Have it all ready for you in the morning. I'm sure we'll have our answer for you in a hurry. In addition to the facts and figures about this new factory proposition, I was glad to get the side information you are always able to give us on conditions generally in your part of the country. You know, without fellows like you, we'd have a much tougher job investing our funds. Well, I'm always glad to help. I mean it. You know more about conditions down there than we could learn in years. That's why we rely on your judgment. Come here. Take a look at some of the projects we're working on with other mortgage bankers from all over the country. Oh, I'd like to. I'm always interested in new ideas. As Jim Chandler studies the fascinating exhibits, the latest ways for making life happier for so many, he secretly thrills again to being a part of this important business with men like Ed Stevens and his associates who feel their solemn responsibility, both to the policyholders and to those who benefit from the mortgage loans. It is a business, yes but a business guided by the highest ideals. In one community, where the need for moderate price housing was critical, our mortgage correspondent came up with this wonderful development to take care of several hundred families of moderate means. As you can see, it's a lot more than just a roof over their heads. Look at that setup, isn't that a knockout? And here's a beauty, a garden apartment unit in another community. And here's something I like. A group of private homes planned for a southern location. The emphasis, you can see, is on individuality. Yet the basic architectural style is admirably adapted to the climate. I think you'll be interested in this one, too. A truly modern office building where the people can really work efficiently in comfort. It's this diversity of projects, Jim, that helps us all diversify our investments, and I don't need to tell you how important that is. That's why you mortgage bankers are the most versatile source of mortgage loans, because you're the makers of all types of mortgages, like the factory you brought in today. Here's another plant we furnished the money for not so long ago. We liked it because it provides about every feature possible for the well-being of the people who work there, including a fully equipped medical department, for example. I'll be on the road in the next few weeks inspecting most of these projects. When are you coming out our way again? Oh, I'll be out there first week in September. Fine. I want to show you how our operation has grown since you saw it last. And the town, too. It's really moving ahead with the times. I look forward to it, Jim. I'll be seeing you, Ed. Right. Soon after Labor Day, Ed Stevens arrives in Chandler's hometown. Jim shows Ed around his office. Ed is keenly interested in the mortgage banker's various departments on the office floor where all aspects of servicing are handled. Oh, Ed, you know this town has some really outstanding real estate people. You see over there? Yeah. The older man with the young couple? That's Gene Guthrie, a local realtor. He and Henry Sherman have worked together before. You can always tell, can't you? A town with good real estate people is a more substantial community because more people own their own homes. That's right. Now, this is the way your payments will work out. The first year, this proportionate share applies on principal, while this part covers interest, taxes, insurance, and so on. Now, through the months and years, your interest payments become less and less, while the part on principal becomes more and more, until by the 20th year, your payments are practically all principal. Now I understand it. That's a good way of showing it. Oh, Mr. Chandler. Oh, excuse me a minute, Ed. Surely. Folks, this is Mr. Chandler. This is Mr. and Mrs. Russell. We've just closed a home loan for them. Oh, good. You know Mr. Guthrie, of course. Oh, yes, of course. How are you, Gene? Hello, Hi. Jim. I hope Mr. Sherman is taking good care of you. He sure is. This is a dream come true for us, owning our own home so soon. Thanks to Mr. Guthrie. He told us about this low-payment mortgage. 
Well, you're in good hands when a realtor like Mr. Guthrie is looking after your interests. He's shown a lot of people how to realize this particular dream. Glad to have met you. If you should ever need me for anything, I'll be around here. Thank you. Good to see you, Gene. Thank you, Jim. Jim, we're glad to have mortgage bankers like you represent us as our loan correspondents. It's more efficient and less expensive. You're doing a job here we couldn't begin to do from our home office. Well, Ed, I figure we all need each other. The Russells need us, and we need the Russells. We need you, and you need us. Gene Guthrie needs all of us, and we all need men like Gene Guthrie. <laughs> you know, Jim, as my little niece said to me the other night, Uncle, you said an armload. <laughs> Seriously, though, uh, this money, the savings of all these people, when put to work in this way, well, it benefits everybody. The butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. Every, every wage earner, every merchant. That's the reason I like this work. I know what you mean, Ed, and I'll go along with that. But now if we're going to inspect those new properties, we better get going. Okay. I'll just pick up my things in the office here. The two men visit several projects in progress. The new Pasco plant, an impressive example of the healthy employment of private capital. The savings of thousands of average citizens. But beyond even that, here is one insurance company, like many others, investing more funds in an area than it receives from the area in premium income. Jim takes Ed around to see the new houses Phil Regan is building with Jim's financing. The insurance company has no financial interest in this part of the project, but Ed Stevens always likes to see what mortgage bankers are doing. Jim is financing the mortgages on these houses. Later, he will transfer the individual mortgages to one of the savings banks or insurance companies he represents. These institutions welcome the opportunity to spread their investments in government-insured mortgages. And the ripples of prosperity, like those from a pebble dropped in the water, reach out farther and farther to benefit more and more people every trade, profession, and business in the community. So there you are. That's what I meant when I was trying to tell you what mortgage bankers are like, what they do. We've come a long way from the housing of our founding fathers. But the progress we have made in this country traces back directly to the ideals and aspirations to which they were dedicated. All of us who have savings accounts and life insurance play a part in today's great building program. And we can take everlasting pride in the knowledge that together with men like Jim Chandler, we are steadily building our own road to better living, now and for the future. people in history. When I first read that on the release, I thought to myself, they call that news? Everyone knows that, even using the word in the broadest sense. We are housed in more comfortable homes and apartments. We buy in more
more efficient stores and shopping centers. We work in healthier offices and factories. We know all this. But how many people know how this amazing progress came about? Where does the money come from? Because accumulated from the premium payments were invested by these companies from the very first in such safe securities as mortgage loans on real estate. And mortgage loans have become a traditional form of investment for these institutions. At about the same time, savings banks were granted charters by the states. And the savings of individuals were not only safeguarded, but channeled into further community enterprises. The rest of the century witnessed unprecedented growth and expansion as American frontiers swept westward toward the Pacific. New towns and cities sprang up in the wake of transcontinental... In the next hundred years, settlements grew and flourished and the folks who worked hard and were thrifty could build better homes and better farms. The settlements became towns and cities. Trade and commerce started. Artisans and merchants expanded their shops and stores. The spirit of the free world had taken root in North America, and the winning of American independence charted its future course. By the late 18th and early 19th century, average citizens, as here in Williamsburg, were beginning to have savings in excess of their immediate needs. This started them looking for the way to provide long-range protection for their dependents. To satisfy this need, life insurance companies were organized, and people began taking out policies. The funds accumulated of the millions, I mean billions of dollars, it takes for this tremendous building program. In fact, it's impossible for the human mind to grasp the total amount of money that has been required to build the America we know today. Where then does all this money come from? Now we're getting to the point that is news, the point this survey makes. And to me, it's a fascinating story, one on which I have had reason to do some interesting research. It really started when the first settlers came to this country on their road to better living. Those sturdy forebears of ours were willing to endure the hardships of the early American wilderness for the sake of personal freedom. And one of the greatest rewards of that freedom was the opportunity to build their own homes and become owners of property, modest though it might be.